So this uh, morning we're going to be taking a look at, I got to tell you, one of the toughest uh, scripture passages uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, this one is rough. This one is tough. But that doesn't mean we ignore it. Am I right here, folks? We need to dig into it. And this is the Apostle Paul, the great apostle, saying these kinds of words in Romans chapter 7. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate to do, what I hate I do. Hmm. And if I do not do what I want to do, I agree the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have desired to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do what is good, but what the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, and I do, it is no longer I, but it is the sin living it within me that does it. Now we're about ready to enter into a time of teaching, so I invite you to turn your attention to the screen. God knows what you've been through. God knows what they say about you. God only knows what's killing you. There's a kind of love that God only knows. God only knows what you've been through. God only knows what they say about you. God only knows the real you. There's a kind of love that God only knows. God only knows. For the lonely, for the ashamed. The misunderstood and the ones to blame. What if we could start over? We could start over. We could start over. For the lonely, for the ashamed, the misunderstood and the ones to blame. What if we could start over? We could start over. We could start over. God only knows. Well, this morning we start a brand new message series. Uh, and this whole message series is just simply called, Will God Come Through? This whole thing is about following God. And i um, got to tell you, when you start following God for a while, it feels like you're in the desert. One of the things I love about this video clip is that he's starting out on a paved road, right? No problem. We know exactly where we're going. But then he looks at the compass and God is saying, this is where you need to go. And then you leave the road, you leave the easy path, and you start heading into the desert. And frankly, when you follow God, sometimes it can be kind of lonely. You know what I mean? It can be hard. After a while, he keeps checking his compass, and then he starts to uh, drink his water, the, uh, his provisions that he has. But after a while, it seems like, Lord, I know I'm heading in your right direction. The compass is telling me where to go, but now I'm running out of water. Lord, are you going to come through for me or not? And then finally, you see the oasis. Now, I've used this metaphor a lot in my preaching over the years, and Someone came up to me and said, well, yeah, I get your whole metaphor and everything, and I think it's pretty cool, but uh, why does God take so long to bring you the, uh, um, the, the, uh, um, the oasis after all? Why does he wait so long to bring the oasis? I said, the oasis didn't move. That was just part of the destination. Sometimes it's a long journey, and sometimes it's hard. And when we start following the Lord with all of our hearts, when we start doing as uh, uh, the choir sang today, give it all over to you, it can be kind of hard. But never lose sight of the fact that God is with you every step of the way. 
So that's what we're going to be talking about during this message series. When we're talking about will God come through, that means that uh, is God going to leave us abandoned in the midst of doing what we are told to do? And uh, we're going to start out with kind of a simple concept today. It's a good one for us to uh, kind of stretch our limbs around this, and that is, uh, will God come through when I feel inadequate? Right? Does anyone ever feel like they're in- inadequate on certain things? Oh, uh, yeah, okay, I was going to say, I hope your pastor's not the only one raising his hand on this one. Oh, brother, oh, brother. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today, but hopefully you'll see the common thread throughout this whole thing is feeling alone when you're walking, when you're following God. Um, that can be part of the deal, especially when the rest of the world is going the other way. It can magnify how that feels. But today we're just going to be talking about a simple idea that Jesus uses all that you offer him. So it doesn't matter if you feel inadequate. Whatever you offer him, he will take and he will magnify all to his purpose and glory. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, let's dive into what, this, uh, what we're really talking about. We're going we're gonna to go through this a, a little bit more slowly today. But first of all, following God can be overwhelming. Can anyone agree with that? When you start to follow God uh, initially as a new Christian, you think, okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you. And for those first few steps, it's actually pretty easy because uh, what you're doing is you're starting to leave a little of those things behind. And what God wants is just basically your attention. You have, uh, have you focus in on him. And those first initial steps are actually kind of exciting. You know, you get to follow the Lord. Maybe you're first of all opening up your Bible and reading and getting on your knees and pray every day so you know what he says and you know who he is. And uh, that, that's actually kind of cool. But then uh, the Lord asks you to take another step that may feel a little bit more uncomfortable. You know what I mean? And that is that first initial uncomfortable step is crucial. We may say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you on this first big uncomfortable step. And I'm going to pray, Lord, I need to know when I take that step, will there be ground underneath me? Sometimes people will say, you know, I'm good where I am. I'm good. I'll read my Bible. I'll pray, but I'm good. But when you start to follow him, that's when it takes trust. That's when all the reading and praying comes into place, when the Lord says, here is the next step. And that can be overwhelming. Overwhelming to the point where you say, yeah, yeah, no something, I'm not going to go there. That's too much to ask. But just wait until you take that next step and the next step and the next step. Here's the, here's the, the real issue here, folks, Okay. If God continues to lead you down the path, you know that it's God. Always test the spirits. Always test to make sure that it's truly God who's guiding your steps. It's going to get harder and harder because each step is bigger and bigger. At what point are you going to say, okay, Lord, I've followed far enough? Or are you going to say, Lord, wherever you lead me, I will follow. So we know it's a tough road. Sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. Yeah, we we always understand that. We get that. We know what that's all about. But now we need to ask, uh, remind ourselves, you know something? It is common. It is understandable. We get the fact that it's common to feel inadequate to the task. Hmm. I got, I'm going to open myself up here a little bit. Is that I've felt more inadequate to this task of leading a church than in almost any other thing I've ever done. Actually, there's no almost about it. Any other thing I've ever done. There were times where I kind of felt like a phony. That, hey... Who am I? Who am I to do this? There have been times when I have uh, thought to myself, man, 
am I even good enough? There have been times when I thought, am I holy enough? There were times when the, the pressures and the intensities of everything that I've been trying to do in order to follow God and to bring the church to a new, closer level, when all the hate and vitriol that was poured out upon me has made me want to say, Lord, you can have it. For a while, um, uh, we uh, lived in, in uh, St. Cloud, and I pastored a small church there that is now uh, no longer there. Actually, it wasn't all that small. It was a decent-sized church, but it was the smallest one in St. Cloud, you know, of all the churches in St. Cloud. And uh, that church was a group of good people who wanted to continually move but there was also a seed of dysfunction that was really hard. And whenever I went over to that church, and by the way, I lived on the other side of the parking lot, so you could never lose sight of where the church was. And I'd walk over every day, and I'd have a different attitude if I knew there was going to be a lot of people there or just a couple. And whenever I knew there was going to be a lot of people there, my stomach would tighten up because you know you just didn't know if you were going to be hugged or slugged. You know what I mean? Ooh, that was tough. If I hadn't had 10 years of good ministry under my belt before I got there, if that would have been my first church, I would have said, Lord, if this is what ministry is all about, you can have it. The main thing is I felt completely inadequate to the task. But that's a common feeling. So if you feel as if you are inadequate to the task, well done, congratulations. All that means is that God's asking you to do something beyond where you are right now, which means God believes that you can do amazing things. All that means is that you feel like, Lord, I can't do that. God is saying, yeah, I know. Isn't it cool? Wait till I bring you to the point where you can do that. Now, uh, even the Apostle Paul, the great apostle, wrestled with all these feelings of inadequacy. He listed out so many times where he didn't feel like he was even worthy to be called an apostle. He called himself the least of all the apostles. And in this particular passage, he reams himself over the coals for failing time and time again. I read uh, a little bit of it earlier, but this is what he says. He says, uh, I don't understand what I do. Uh, for what I do, I do not want to do, but uh, what I hate. Uh, actually, I, I learned a different translation that I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. Isn't that crazy? You know what you should do when you know what you shouldn't do. You're heading in this direction, but next thing you know, you're failing time and time again. And he goes on to say it like this, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, but as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living within me. Isn't that just the sign of inadequacy? Where he says, I can't even do it right because it's the sin in me. Who am I to follow the Lord with all this in me? For I know that good itself is, does not dwell in me. That's a sign of saying, wow, I don't even have good inside me. That is my sinful nature. He goes on to say it like this. For if I desire to do what is good, I cannot carry it out. For I do not do what is good, but I do the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. And if I do not do what I want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. Can you imagine the great apostle Paul gripped with this kind of inadequacy? But I think God used him pretty well, don't you? 
I think with all of his inadequacies, God called him and said, you know something, Paul? Have I got a chore for you? You are going to take the gospel to all of the nations outside of Israel. And Paul said, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. What do you want me to do next week, huh? No, it's an overwhelming task. And it was all taking uh, the Apostle Paul with all of his gifts, but all of his failings, molding him and shaping him to something that was better and glorious. And that is because of this. We have to rely upon God's power and less upon our own. We can't rely upon what we can do. If we rely upon only the things uh, that we are able to do, we're going to be powerfully limited. We are going to not be able to do anything in God's sight. What we would be able to do if we just simply rely upon what we can do, man, it would be pitiful. It would be hardly anything at all. <laughs> but I think that's how so many Christians, especially in the Western world, end up living. Okay, God, I'll do what I can do. And for the most part, we're pretty generous at that. Do the things we can do. But the real power, authority, and majesty lies upon doing those things that we can't do. Where God molds us and shapes us. It's all, we often use the term of like a, the, 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 the master in the clay, right? Molding us and shaping us. I don't like that so much because it sounds too easy just to be molded and shaped. Sometimes, you know, I know my own self and a lot of times I don't feel like clay. I feel like granite, this big piece of granite. And God isn't just using his thumbs to uh, mold me and shape me, but he's using a hammer and a chisel and pounding away at all those things that don't belong. Because it's not about me. Now, God will take whatever we give him, but be prepared to be molded and shaped into something glorious, something amazing. Again, this is the Apostle Paul. He says, um, but he said to me, this is when he, when he said that he had this thorn in his flesh and God asked him three times to take him away. He says this, my grace is, significant, is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in strength. That's not what it says, does it? My power is made perfect in weakness. Ah, therefore, I will boast all the more about my weaknesses so Christ's power may rest on me. And not only that, he goes on to say it so boldly and passionately. That is why, for Christ's sakes, I delight in my weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For I know, which bends your mind, this doesn't make sense, that when I am weak, I am strong. Because when I'm weak, it's my weakness. Amen? But when I'm strong, we know very well that it's not me. But the strength comes from God. And that's where everything comes into place. We need to understand, yes, I feel inadequate to the task, as you probably should. But that's only because you're relying on your own strength and power and not upon what God can do in your own life. We also need to understand this is such a magnificent uh, understanding where we know that God gives you the ability to do God-sized dreams. Think of it this way. I can't think of a single instance where I can say that God called someone to use their own abilities because it's not sufficient, right? God doesn't call the able. What he does is he enables the people he called. He doesn't take us. He takes what we give him, but then he glorifies and blows them up and makes them more powerful than you can possibly imagine. 
if we allow God to do the heavy work of taking the hammer and chisel and making us into something that would be really, really cool. That is the key. That, my friends, is what we need to wrap our minds around. And believe me, there have been times in my life and ministry and when I'm following God the best I possibly can where God puts me to the test. Of course, God only puts me to the test because he says, I'm going to call you anyway. Are you going to take the next step? I think I've told this story before, but I want to bring a different spotlight on it. Uh, when I uh, said, okay, Lord, you've been calling me into ministry all these years. I'm finally going to stop fighting it, and I'm going to follow you. And I took that first step, big step, into what ministry is all about. And it was pretty good. Now, I've been following Jesus with uh, open your book and read and get on your knees in prayer for a long time. But this is the first time God made me take a big step. My next big step was to go to local pastor school. That's when I realized that I'm not good enough. No question. When I got there, I realized that everyone was ahead of me. And I mean everyone. People have not only been in the church for way longer, but they've been leading the church. Some of them were already pastors, local pastors who just haven't gone through the class yet. These people came in here and they knew every song, they knew every bit of uh, the book of worship, they knew so many things and I felt like, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. I don't belong here. And that first day was so chaotic. I tried to come before the Lord and pray and say, Lord, Lord, what are you doing? But every part of the day was structured so tight. I didn't have any time on my own. And you think I'm exaggerating the point, but oh my God, as soon as I close my eyes, I can remember every little bit of it. I went to my dorm room and all I did is throw my suitcase in there. The bed wasn't even made. I fell down on the bed and I was about ready to say, Lord, get me out of here. I don't think I heard you right. But before the words were, you know what it is when it's in your mind, but the words haven't even formed in your mind? You just kind of know what you want to say, but you haven't even found a way to say it? God knows that too, amen? As soon as, before I could even speak a word, before they were even formed in my brain, I felt the Holy Spirit just wash over me, bringing peace and comfort and saying, I don't make mistakes. I called you. Walk with me. Follow me. And I will make you able to do it. Do you know how humbling that? Sorry about that. It's humbling. It's humbling to know that, yeah, you're not good enough, but you don't have to be good enough. It's not about you. It's never been about me. It's all been about where God is trying to bring us. If we're trying to do God-sized dreams because God put it in our hearts, he will make us able to do those things. He will give us more than we are, and he will shape us to be more than what we can do by simply giving it all to him and saying, Lord, if I can't make that next step, give me what it takes to take that next step. It's not about whether you're good enough, because you're not. Neither am I. I remember the first time I said yes to ministry, I said, yeah, I'm a public speaker. You know, I'm, my degree's in theater and all that. But holy cow, if you think preaching is the only thing preachers do, you don't know a fraction of it. Everything else, the Lord has had to take the hammer and chisel and whack away at me. Now, do you think that makes me better? No, I'm still me. But the Lord has allowed me to understand my weaknesses. 
and bring me more strength. Again, the Apostle Paul, he understands what this is all about when he says, not that we are competent in ourselves or claim anything for ourselves, right? But we are competent, our competence comes from God. He has made us competent ministers of the new covenant, not by the letter, but by the Spirit. Of the, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Oh, how beautiful. Let me just tell you something here, folks. God is calling you to do something. I don't know what it is. You need to listen to him yourself, okay? But God is calling you to take a step that will make you feel uncomfortable. In fact, I do believe that God not only works through individuals in the church, but the church as a whole. And I believe that uh, the Lord is asking us as a church to take another step towards something good and glorious and beautiful that will make us feel uncomfortable that will make us feel weird. But we are the ones who need to choose. We are the ones who, are, who need to say, Lord, I will take that next step. Or say, no, Lord, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just going to stay where I am. I'm just going to stay here and maybe complain about things. Or say, Lord, wow. Wow. I don't know if I can do it on my own. But if you wrap your ever-loving arms around me, hold my hand, take my life, I will make the next step all for you. All for you. Now we're going to pray. And as we pray, I don't know what you should be praying for, to be honest with you. I don't know what the Lord has been whispering into your life. But what I do ask is that you are ready to truly hear what the Lord is saying to you. I know you've heard me say this a lot, but uh, I'm going to invite you, if you feel comfortable, to pray with your palms open. And this is just a reminder to us that we are here to receive whatever God is trying to lay into our lives. But however the Lord is speaking to you today, don't be too quick to say no. Be ready to say yes. Oh, precious Lord Jesus, we do love you. We do thank you. Lord, we want to follow you. We want to follow you with all that we have. We want to come before you and say it's all about you. We want to know, Lord, that even in our inadequacies, your strength is sufficient for me, for us. And Lord, show me. Show me this morning the next step you want me to take and where we should go. We love you praise you, and we will follow you, Lord Jesus, wherever you lead us. For it's all in Jesus' holy, precious, and glorious name that we pray. We pray all of this in your name, O oh Lord, knowing that we will receive what you have to offer. We lift this to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.